You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, episode number 208. Film is a battleground. Sam Fuller. Broadcasting from a dark, windowless room in Hollywood, when we really should be working on that next draft. It's the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, showing you the craft and business of screenwriting while teaching you how to make your screenplay bulletproof. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by Bulletproof Script Coverage. Now, unlike other script coverage services, Bulletproof Script Coverage actually focuses on the kind of project you are and the goals of the project you are. So we actually break it down by three categories, micro-budget, indie film market, and studio film. There's no reason to get coverage from a reader that's used to reading tentpole movies when your movie's going to be done for $100,000. And we wanted to focus on that at Bulletproof Script Coverage. Our readers have worked with Marvel Studios, CAA, WME, NBC, HBO, Disney, Scott Free, Warner Brothers, The Blacklist, and many, many more. So if you need your screenplay or TV script covered by professional readers, head on over to CoverMyScreenplay.com. Today's show is also sponsored by screenwriting software, Arc Studio. Now, Arc Studio is easy to use, rock solid, and covers the whole flow. Structure, writing, rewriting, exchanging notes with partners, and so much more. It's also great for collaboration and writer's rooms. For example, it's been used in the writer's room of Arcane, the hit Netflix show. Now, if you want to check this out for free, all you got to do is go to arcstudiopro.com and sign up. But because you are listening to this episode, you're going to get $30 off all of their paid plans. So check out arcstudiopro.com forward slash bulletproof to see why they are taking Hollywood by storm. That's arcstudiopro.com forward slash bulletproof. Well, guys, today you are in for a treat. I am bringing to you another audiobook preview from IFH Books. Now, the author of this book is Carly Iglesias, who is a author, story guru, and been a guest on the show many times. Actually, he's one of the most popular guests that's ever been on the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast. And Carl and I got together to release the audiobook version, which is basically a seminar based on his best-selling seminal work in story called Writing for Emotional Impact. Now, you're going to get a little bit of a taste of what this book is. And if you want a free audiobook copy of Writing for Emotional Impact by Carl Iglesias. All you have to do is go to freefilmbook.com and subscribe to a free account on Audible. When you do that, you get one free book and you just go to go pick up that book and there you go. Now you could do that or you could just pick it up on Audible if you already have an account and uh, and pick it up that way. But it is a great, great, great book and I'm so excited to be sharing this with you guys. So without any further ado, enjoy your free preview of Writing for Emotional Impact by Carl Iglesias. Bulletproof Screenwriting and IFH Books presents Writing for Emotional Impact, Advanced Dramatic Techniques to Attract, Engage, and Fascinate the Reader from Beginning to End by Carl Iglesias. Performed by Carl Iglesias. Introduction. It's not about plot points. It's not about act structure. It's not about character. It's all about emotion. There are three kinds of feelings when you read a story. Boredom, interest, and wow. To become a successful screenwriter, you must create that wow feeling on as many pages as possible. And this requires writing that engages the reader emotionally. In his best-selling book, 101 Habits of Highly Successful Screenwriters, screenwriter Carl Iglesias explored the working habits of A-list Hollywood scribes. Now he breaks new ground by focusing on the psychology of the reader. Based on his acclaimed classes at the UCLA Extension, writing for emotional impact goes beyond the basics and argues that Hollywood is in the emotion delivery business, selling emotional experiences packaged in movies and TV shows. Carl not only encourages you to deliver emotional impact on as many pages as possible, 
He shows you how, offering you hundreds of dramatic techniques to take your writing to the professional level. What you're about to listen to is the screenwriting masterclass that inspired Carl to write the book, Writing for Emotional Impact. Everything in the book is based on this seminar, but this seminar goes a little bit deeper than the book does, so you are in for a treat. I personally read this book early on in my screenwriting career, and I can't tell you what an impact, no pun intended, it had on my life as a storyteller and specifically as a screenwriter, getting my screenplays read and optioned by major Hollywood producers. I am so proud to present Writing for Emotional Impact as the first of many books in the Bulletproof Screenwriting audiobook series. Sit back and enjoy. Alex Ferrari, writer, director, producer, podcaster, author, public speaker, and founder of Indie Film Hustle, Film Entrepreneur, and Bulletproof Screenwriting. Thank you very much, and uh, welcome to this uh, seminar on uh, dialogue. We're going to be talking about crafting fresh dialogue for emotional impact. Uh, we're presenting lots and lots and lots of techniques, along with uh, script examples, to give you a set of tools that you can use to go over your dialogue and then make it that much fresher and sharper and just make it like crackle pop and pop off the page. So... Uh, uh, my name is Carl Iglesias. I'm the uh, author of The One-on-One Habits of Highly Successful Screenwriters and the upcoming Writing for Emotional Impact, uh, which is all about the craft. Okay, without further ado, uh, let's find out what, we're gonna, what are we going to be talking about today. Uh, what dialogue must accomplish in a script? The most common dialogue problems and how to fix them. What constitutes great dialogue? And I've actually separated it into four categories. Emotional impact. Individuality, meaning how to write individual dialogue, unique voices to separate your characters. One of the most important things, how to provide information through your dialogue in a subtle way. Because what I see a lot in scripts, uh, amateur scripts, is just plain old on the nose, really boring uh, and obvious exposition. And lastly, we're going to talk a little, bit, a little bit about subtext, which actually will be covered in depth in the next seminar, the psychology of subtext. So I'll talk a little bit about it, but I won't give you actual techniques that will be the, uh, the next seminar. And you will have a lot of homework after this seminar, because I will tell you, give you a list of the dialogue masters that you have to read, okay? One of the best ways to learn how to write is to read scripts rather than going see the movies because you can actually see how the, uh, how the writer writes on the page and how he evokes an emotion in the reader. Whereas in the movie theaters, you're experiencing the emotions uh, from the craft of about 200 craftsmen, the music, uh, the cinematography, the editing. So there's no way to find out how to do it on the page. So the only way to do it is to... Uh, through reading the, the, uh, the scripts, and I'll tell you which writers are, are considered great dialogue masters for you to study. Okay, so let's start with what dialogue must accomplish. Most of the books and seminars, unfortunately, dialogue tends to be glossed over, and, and the reason for that is that most people believe that dialogue cannot be taught, in a sense, and there's a little bit of truth to that. People think you have to have a, an ear, just like a musician, you know, is talented, has a good ear. Dialogue must accomplish several things. Uh, what you read is that it must advance the, the plot, right? It must advance, provide exposition, and reveal character. Those are usually the two things that uh, teachers teach. But as you'll see right now, it actually has to accomplish a lot of different things, too. And I'll go through each one uh, carefully. The very first thing is reveal character. That's an obvious. What a character says and how he says it or she says it reveals their character. It must reflect the speaker's mood and emotions. It must also reveal or hide the speaker's motivation. The most common one is advance the action and uh, carry information or exposition. And this is what I see in about 99% of amateur scripts. Most of the dialogue is just straight information. It should foreshadow what's to come. And of course... It should have emotional impact. And by that, I mean that the dialogue should be funny, tense, you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera. This is what great dialogue does. It provides emotional impact. So what I'm going to do is actually talk about uh, some of the most common dialogue problems that I see in amateur scripts. And we'll talk about also how to fix them. Okay. 
Those, uh, and this will be in order, meaning from the least common to the most common. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. So what I see a lot is what we call stilted or formal dialogue. And stilted means that it's very literary, it's grammatically correct. Another thing you see a lot is that dialects are hard to read. A lot of amateur writers uh, create a character that's from a particular uh, region or country and uh, actually write and actually phonetically spell the dialect so that when you, when you read it, you technically hear it. Now, it's, it's good to a certain point, but what I see a lot is that it's really hard to read, and that takes you out of the reading. You're trying to figure out, what is he saying, okay? And I'll show you a way uh, of how to fix that. So dialects are hard to read. Try to avoid... Uh, try to avoid that. Characters talk too much. In other words, you see a lot of huge chunks of dialogue in scenes. Characters all talk the same. This is a very, very common thing. And usually the voice is the writers, obviously. In other words, every chunk of dialogue you see, every character speaks the same way. And uh, one of the ways to, one of the standards you should shoot for is to actually hide the characters names in your script. Once you print it out, like the first draft, hide it and then read the dialogue. And you should be able to know who's speaking just from the dialogue. That's your, that's your standard. Okay? Dialogue is predictable. You see this a lot in bad television. Um, and even good television, sometimes I actually see that. Uh, and this is when you're able to predict what the next response will be to a dialogue. You know, some, somebody says, I love you. The most common response that we saw the time, I love you too, right? And your job as a screenwriter is to write unpredictable dialogue, okay? Dialogue is wooden, flat, and bland. And this usually occurs uh, through the exposition. When you see exposition, and it's just, you know straight information. Uh, it's also flat, it's bland, it's boring. Dialogue is too expository, and the reason for that is because the writer doesn't know how to write, provide exposition in a subtle way. And then of course, who can predict what the last and biggest problem is? Dialogue is on the nose, the most common problem. And on the nose means that the dialogue is exactly what the character is thinking, what the character wants, uh, character's motivation, desires. It's just on the nose. I mean, it's exactly what they're thinking and want to say. And the reason it's boring, I'll talk about it in a second. Actually, I'll talk about it in the subtext uh, seminar because that will be the bulk of this, uh, of this problem. Okay, so what constitutes great dialogue? Emotional impact, individuality, meaning each character has their own voice, subtle exposition, and then subtext. Okay, so I'm going to start now with uh, the very first category, emotional impact. And what I'll do is actually give you the technique, and I'll show you examples from scripts, okay? And you'll be able to see it in action from great scripts. So cliche alternatives is your very first technique. And as the title implies, it just means turning your cliche, taking cliches, cliche lines that you've heard, and turning them to your advantage, meaning use an alternative to that, okay? And let me show you an example. This is from Lethal Weapon by Shane Black. Oh, by the way, guy who shot me? Yeah. Same guy who shot Lloyd. Jesus, you sure? I never forget an asshole. Okay? Now, what would have been the cliche there? The cliche would have been, I never forget a face. Right? That's a line you've heard a hundred times. Shane Black took that line, it's a cliche, and just tweak, tweaked it just a bit and made it, I'll never forget an asshole, and that made it, that made it funny. All right? So that's one example. This is an example from Body Heat by Lawrence Kasdan. Uh, this is a scene where uh, Racine, played by William Hurt, and uh, Maddie, played by Kathleen Turner, uh, are in the bar. And obviously, they're attracted to each other. Um, most men are little boys. Maybe you should drink at home. Too quiet. Maybe you shouldn't dress like that. This is a blouse and a skirt. I don't know what you're talking about. You shouldn't wear that body. Okay? Great line. What would have been the cliche line there? You shouldn't wear that dress. Okay? In this case, he just tweaked a little bit. You shouldn't wear that body and just raise it to another level. So that's an alternative to a cliche. Let me give you another example. This is from 48 Hours. I love this example. 
crazy. Oh, you guys were in last, last week. You better ask around. I'm not supposed to be hassled. I got friends. Hey, park the tongue for a second, sweet pants. We just want to search the room. Okay? Where is the, uh, well, what would have been the cliche? This is in the second, uh, the response there from Vincent. He would have said, hey, shut up. Or, hey, quiet. That would have been a cliche, right? But he said, park the tongue for a second. Okay? A little witty alternative. So that's three examples for a cliche alternative. Let me give you another technique that's called the comeback zinger. This is pretty self-explanatory. Now, everybody knows what a zinger is, right? It's a, it's a quick, witty comeback that's usually supposed to attack a person. Um, this is very common in buddied films, right? Like 48 hours, rush hour. One person sets up the line, the other person just comes back with a zinger, just back and forth. And I think in uh, Saturday Night Live, too, they, they, had, they have a character who's like Mr. Zinger, right? And the whole thing. So you understand the concept. So let me give you some examples of comeback zingers. This is also from 48 Hours. We ain't brothers, we ain't partners, and we ain't friends. And if Gans gets away with my money, you're going to be sorry you ever met me. I'm already sorry. Okay? So there's a little zinger there. From Aliens. One of the lines that got the biggest laugh, laughs in the movie, Vasquez is, a, is the woman Marine, right? Hudson, hey, Vasquez, have you been mistaken for a man? No, have you? Okay, come back, Zinger. This is from All About Eve. Great script, by the way, to study, because it's got like hundreds and hundreds of really witty lines and comebacks from uh, um, Mankiewicz. Uh, Bill, is it sabotage? Does my career mean nothing to you? Have you no human consideration? Show me a human and I might have. Okay, so Margo is insulting. All right. Exaggeration is your another set of techniques. And this is a great device to amuse the reader. Now, exaggerations are not meant to be taken literally, okay? You exaggerate something, so they're supposed to be taken metaphorically. And I'll, when I show you examples, you'll see what I'm talking about. This is from Annie Hall, Woody Allen. After Annie parks the car, don't worry, we can walk to the curb from here. Okay, remember she parked the car a little far? Okay, that's an exaggeration. And then later on, there's another line where it says, Honey, there's a spider in your bathroom the size of a Buick. Okay, that's an exaggeration, obviously. The spider is not the size of a Buick, but just the line itself, metaphorically, it just sounds great. Okay, so exaggeration. Another example, this is from the Gilmore Girls. Now, I don't watch that show, but I, I, I've seen a couple of episodes, and it's incredibly witty. It's like the lines just go like that. So it's a great script. I've actually read a couple of scripts, and I've just been going, my God, this is really great, great dialogue. Um, my parents uh, set me up with the son of a business associate. He's going to be a doctor. How old is he? 16. So he's going to be a doctor in 100 years. My parents like to plan ahead. Okay? So the exaggeration there is he's going to be a doctor in like 100 years. Okay? And from as good as it gets, Carol, an ear infection can send us to the emergency room maybe five, six times a month where I get whatever nine-year-old they just made a doctor. Nice chatting with you. Okay? You see the, uh, what the exaggeration here is? The nine-year-old doctor. Whatever nine-year-old they, they uh, made a doctor. So it just raises your dialogue to another level when you use that, that particular technique. All right, comic comparison is another technique. Now, this is about humor. It's a humor technique, actually. And um, a lot of people think, well, you need to be funny. I, I agree. Okay, you need to actually be funny to come up with funny lines. But if you really study humor, you come up with actually the, quote, the science of humor. Actually, humor is a science, in a sense. You know, probably more science than art. Um, and if you really study, this is one technique, actually, is the most common techniques in humor, which is to compare two things that creates the laughter. And I'll show you an example. So this is a technique called comic uh, comparison. Nice to meet you. Oh, and who might this be? This is Eddie, which is the dog. I call him Eddie Spaghetti. Oh, he likes pasta? No, he has worms. <laughs> okay. Um, so that, that laugh was generated because he's actually comparing, you know, spaghetti pasta and, and comparing it with worms. Okay, here's another example. This is from Notting Hill. Uh, there's something wrong with this yogurt. It's mayonnaise. 
Oh. <laughs> okay. Remember that that scene? Okay, it's comparing you know yogurt with mayonnaise. Okay. Next one is from Manny Hall. Uh, it's so clean out here. That's because they don't throw their garbage away. They turn into television. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Okay, they were talking about Los Angeles. <laughs> if you remember that, that's a great script to read too. Obviously, Best Picture, Academy Award. Um, so obviously, they compare TV with garbage in this case. Okay. So comic comparison. All right, moving on. Something I call lists. This is very self-explanatory. This is about using specific lists for dramatic effect, which can include usually, uh, this is used a lot to show a character's frustration. Uh, just as a little secret there. Let me show you some examples. Um, this is going to be hard to read but because there's a lot of it. But this is the scene in Aaron Brockovich where uh, the love interest is introduced and he's, he's asking her for her number. And she says, uh, uh, which number do you want, George? You got more than one? Shit, yeah. I got numbers coming out of my ear. Like, for instance, 10. 10? Sure, that's one of my numbers. It's how many uh, months old my little girl is. You got a little girl? Yeah, sexy, huh? And here's another. Five. That's how old my other daughter is. Seven is my son's age. Two is how many times I've been married and divorced. You getting all this? Sixteen is the number of dollars in my bank account. Four, five, four, three, nine, four, three is my phone number. And with all the numbers I gave you, I'm guessing zero is the number of times you're going to call it. Okay? So there's the list right there. She's giving him the list of numbers. And that's really, really well done. Let me give you another example. Numbers, some, something's got to give with Jack Nicholson and uh, Diane Keaton. Can we talk tomorrow? What for? I saw your friend you were having dinner with. Is, is, that, what, is that what you want? It's never going to work with me. Look at me. I'm a, I'm a middle-aged woman. Don't let this brown hair fool you. I don't have real brown hair on my head. I'm almost all gray. That would freak you out, wouldn't it? And I have high cholesterol, and my back hurts every morning, and I'm postmenopausal, and I have osteoporosis, and I'm sure arthritis is just around the corner, and I know you've seen my varicose veins. Let's face it, man, that's not quite the buzz you're looking for. All right? List of all her little ailments. Now, actually, this illustrates a good point, because, you know, you have a lot of teachers that tell you do not have huge chunks of dialogue, right? Tell you only one or two liners. But this works because it's using one of the techniques, so this particular chunk of dialogue has emotional impact. And the secret here is that when you have emotional impact, it doesn't matter how long your, your speech is, okay? The reader is not thinking, oh, this is too long. This is amateur, because he's really impacted by that speech. Okay, another example. This is from Bedazzled. Not a good film, but the script was okay. Um, the original is even better, by the way. Uh, the Devil. There's nothing sinister here. Paragraph 1 states that I, the Devil, a nonprofit or, uh, corporation with offices in Purgatory, Hell, and Los Angeles, will give you seven wish, wishes to use as you, fit, as you see fit. Why seven? Why not eight? Why not six? I don't know. Seven sounds right. It's a magical, mystical thing. Seven days of the week, seven deadly sins, seven up, seven dwarves, okay? Okay? So there's the list right there at the bottom. And it also creates a nice rhythm, too, which is really important in, uh, in dialogue. All right. One of my favorite techniques is metaphors and similes. Now, um, I think I spoke uh, about metaphors and similes in the description, when you use descriptions. Uh, this is for dialogue. And a metaphor, for those, those of you who don't know, is uh, when you compare something, you say this particular thing is something else. Like, uh, you know, you try to describe somebody, uh, a sneaky guy, and you say, he's a snake. Okay, that's a metaphor. But if you say, he is like a snake, that's a simile. So let me give you some examples of that. This is from Bull Durham. Another excellent script. Is somebody going to go to bed with somebody or what? You're a regular nuclear meltdown, honey. Slow down. Okay? So the very first one there, you're, you're, she's comparing him to a nuclear meltdown. You're a regular nuclear meltdown. That's the metaphor. And then later on, uh, Christ says, guy hit the shit out of that one, huh? Well, I held it like an egg, and he scrambled the son of a bitch. Having fun yet? Okay, this is after he told him you have to hold the ball like an egg when you pitch it. The guy does, the guy pitched the ball and he slams it like a home, uh, for a home run and he's trying to figure out. So I held it like an egg is the simile and then he scrambled the son of a bitch, right? Instead of saying and then he hit the home run, which would have been on the nose, 
he says he scrambled the son of a bitch. That's a really interesting uh, metaphor. And then, of course, all about Eve, which has hundreds of them. There's a sudden sharp yell from the bathroom. You're supposed to zip the zipper, not me. Like trying to zip a pretzel, stand still, Bill grins. What a documentary those two would make, like the mongoose and the cobra. Okay? So just in that little three lines, you have like two, right? Zip a pretzel and like a mongoose and the cobra. And from Casablanca, another great script that has a lot of metaphors, similes, and just all around great dialogue. My interest is whether Victor Laszlo stays or goes is purely a sporting one. In this case, you have no sympathy for the fox, huh? Not particularly. I understand the point of view of the hound, too. Okay? So they're comparing what's going on, you know, the Nazis after Victor Laszlo, like a fox hunt. And this is the reason when, you know, obviously, when you don't know the, all these techniques, basically, when you read the script, you're going, wow, it's just, it's all subconscious, you're reading that, and you're going, wow, this is great writing, you're not stopping, going, oh, this is it, but as a writer, you have to know these things, as a writer, when you have mastery of the craft, this is what we're talking about, okay, a really funny one from Austin Powers, the spy who shagged me, Dr. Evil. You're not quite evil enough. You're semi-evil. You're quasi-evil. You're the margarine of evil. You're the Diet Coke of evil. Just one calorie, not evil enough. <laughs> okay? This can also be also like a list, too, because he's going through the, the whole list of them. But obviously, a lot of metaphors there. Okay. Another great technique uh, is called parallel construction. Now, this is to create rhythm and dialogue. A lot of politicians use that in speeches, by the way, the parallel construction. And uh, like, for example, Martin Luther King, I have a dream. You keep repeating, I have a dream. JFK's line, a famous line, ask not what the country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. That's a parallel construction. I'm going to show you some examples of that. This is from Rocky. Look, Bob, if you want to dance, you got to pay the band. If you borrow, you got to pay the man. Me, I ain't emotionally involved. Okay, so the parallel construction is this is the first line. If you want to dance, you got to do this. If you borrow, you have to do that. Okay, so it's a it's it's the same construction as the first line, and it just creates a nice rhythm. Let me give you another example from Apocalypse Now. Kurtz, we must kill them. We must incinerate them. Pig after pig, cow after cow, village after village, army after army. So now you see a whole bunch of them. You see how they're all constructed the same way. Parallel construction. And then from the Gilmore Girls again. Oh, Grandpa, how's the insurance biz? People die, we pay. People crash, cars, we pay. People lose a foot, we pay. All right. Another technique, progressive dialogue. Now, as the name implies, this means it's dialogue that actually progresses either upwardly or downwardly. And I'll show you an example of what I mean by that. Uh, this is from Monty Python, Flying Circus. This is a sketch. The interviewer is uh, interviewing a camel spotter. So in three years, you've spotted no camels. Yes, in three years. Uh, I tell a lie, four. Be fair, five. I've been camel spotting for just the seven years. Before that, of course, I was a Yeti spotter. A Yeti spotter? That must have been interesting. You've seen one, you've seen them all. And have you seen them all? Well, I've seen one. Well, a little one. A picture of, I've heard of them. <laughs> okay? So actually, this is a great example because you have both. You have the upward progression where he's talking about the years, right? I've seen them in three years. Ah, uh, no, four. Well, I've seen seven years, right? So that creates an effect that's progressively up. And then the last line is progressively down. I've seen one. Uh, I've seen a picture of, you know, I've heard of them. Okay? So that creates an, a nice effect. This is another example from Almost Famous, Cam and Crow script. Penny Lane, how old are you? 18. Me too. How old are we really? 17. Me too. Actually, I'm 16. Me too. <laughs> Isn't it funny? The truth just sounds different. I'm 15. Right? Remember that scene? So this here, we have a, a downward progression. It creates a really nice exchange. And then a uh, famous one from Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, David Mamet. 
Uh, Blake, we're adding a little something to this month's sales contest. As you all know, first prize is a Cadillac Eldorado. Anyone want to see second prize? Second prize is a set of steak knives. Third prize is you're fired. Okay? So, obviously, another uh, upward progression here. Okay. This is one of my favorite, favorite, favorite uh, techniques, what I call push-button dialogue. Now, as the name implies, this is dialogue that pushes someone else's buttons. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now, back to the show. And causes an emotional reaction. Now, it doesn't have to be a nasty thing, like, you know, you're trying to insult them, that would be like a comeback zinger. It could be also, you want to make them like you, you want them to love you, so, you know, you also would say a line, and I'll show examples of that too. But if you... If you think about your most favorite, uh, like favorite, favorite lines of dialogue in the history of movies, okay, there chances are like seven out of ten of them are push-button dialogue techniques. Okay, they're really, really effective. So famous lines like, you know, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. That's a push-button dialogue. Uh, you're not too smart, are you? I like that in a man. That's that's from Body Heat. Um, and, okay, let me give you some examples of that. This is from Real Genius. Uh, oh, you're the new stud, aren't, are you? Uh, or is it dud? How do you mean? Stud, hotshot, brain? You're a 12-year-old, right? I'm 15. Does your body know that? Okay, he's insulting his intelligence. A push button right there. As good as it gets, there's a couple of them there. Oh, come on, uh, come on in and try not to ruin everything by being you. All right. And then later on, Carol, when you first came into breakfast, uh, when I saw you, I thought you were handsome. Then, of course, you spoke. Okay. Another push button. And now there's a great line from Silence of the Lambs. Lecter, why do you think he removes their skins, Agent Starling? Thrill me with your acumen. It excites him. Most serial killers uh, keep some sort of trophies from their victims. I didn't. No, you ate yours. Okay? Who we'll push, pushes buttons there. And vice versa. Actually, one of the most, uh, uh, most memorable scenes is when both people are pushing their buttons back and forth, you know? From uh, another example from uh, Something's Gotta Give. Wow, it's the perfect beach house. I know, my mother doesn't know how to do things that aren't perfect, which explains you, okay? So in this case, that's, you know, he's actually giving her a compliment, right? So he's pushing her romance buttons there. So it doesn't all have to be negative. Okay, and this is kind of a little long, but this is the famous uh, body heat scene. I'm a married woman, meaning what? Meaning I'm not looking for company. She turns back towards the ocean. Then you should have said, I'm a happily married woman. That's my business. What? How happy I am. And how happy is that? You're not too smart, are you? I like that in a man. All right? Famous line from Body Heat. All right. Uh, let's move on. Of three more uh, techniques under that category. This is reversals. And uh, this is when... Uh, as the name implies, uh, a reversal is when a character takes the opposite turn in the middle of a thought. All right, let me give you some examples of that. Reversals. As good as it gets. You want to dance? I've been thinking about it for a while. And Carol rises. And? No. Okay. You see the reversal there? That creates humor. When Harry meets Sally, uh, I've been doing a lot of thinking, and the thing is, I love you. What? I love you. How do you expect me to respond to this? How about you love me too? How about I'm leaving? Okay, so you got a reversal, and actually this is also an example of another technique you just saw. How about you love me too? How about I'm leaving? Parallel construction, right? From Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, William Goldman's famous script. I think we lost them. Do you think we lost them? No, neither do I. Okay, you see, very simple, right? Very simple reversal. Um, creates, creates an emotional impact right there. Okay. Another technique you have at your disposal is understatement. And this is the opposite of exaggeration, right? Remember you had exaggeration in your toolbox? This is the opposite, understatement. And this is when you actually uh, 
the, the you downplay the dialogue downplays you know the problem like the famous line in Apollo 13 Houston we have a problem that's a good example of uh, understatement all right from almost famous Anita shakes hands uh, with mom and exits as the car takes off she'll be back in the distance we hear the whoop of her daughter maybe not soon <laughs> Okay, so that's an understatement. From Psycho, mother isn't quite herself today. <laughs> Very simple. The mother of all understatements, right? From Last Boy Scout, uh, one of Shane Black's scripts. The two men approach the door. Jimmy takes out his key ring. The cops are going to uh, want to check this place out, so don't disturb anything. Yes, Massa. Uh, Jimmy opens the door, flips on the lights, stopped, stops in his, tract, in his tracks. The room has been systematically torn to pieces. Broken furniture, shredded clothing everywhere. It looks like a combat zone. I think someone disturbed some stuff, Joe. Okay, understatement.
We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show.
We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show.
We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show.
We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show.
We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show.
I hope you guys really enjoyed that free preview. Again, if you want to get a free copy of this audiobook on Audible, all you got to do is head over to freefilmbook.com and sign up for a free account on Audible. Or you could just pick it up on Audible or Amazon uh, if you want to purchase it outright. So if you want to get links to not only how to get a copy of this book, but also check out the other interviews I have done with Carl, all you have to do is head over to the show notes at Bulletproof Screenwriting. Dot TV forward slash 208. Thank you again so much for listening, guys. As always, keep on writing no matter what. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast at bulletproofscreenwriting.tv. 